Super's film before a live studio audience. When I was a teenager, I had a girlfriend who came from a motorsporting family steeped in history. And before I last touched her, I kind of inherited her Mini. Those guys were a revelation for me in terms of what a Mini could be and, you know, what it was to drive a Mini. I've reconnected with them and the reason is I want to bring you their stories. They have so much to tell. And I would hope that it would become a recurring feature because I can't see how I'd even fit it into two episodes, let, us, let alone one. So what I'm doing is I'm driving us out to the unit where the yellow Range Rover is because that's also where my one remaining Mini is because I'd like to see it. I haven't seen it in a while. So while I drive us out, let's have a look at what's happening with the Vogue. Where were we? Oh yeah, the horrific scene on the offside. Well, I cleaned it up and I got straight back into it. And I don't know about you, but I find myself sometimes mesmerized by what I have to do, wondering how I'm going to do it, just sitting, staring. Anyway, I zipped the bottom off the A pillar and then because I hadn't really taken that much stock of it, I sat there daydreaming, I offered it back up just to see again what was missing and what should it really look like before I started templating. You're going to see three or four attempts at me templating this here. I got it wrong, I knew it was wrong kind of early on into generating these angles. Um, some people I'm sure could do this just by bending the piece of metal. I have to take measurements and see this in cardboard, see it down on paper, see it in 3D before I make the steel panel. So a lot of these lines are just reference lines for the fold lines that I make off them, if you get me. So back on to offer up and it looked good. Now obviously the radii aren't in this for the bends but they will come just by bending the metal itself. This was looking great. Over to the sheet metal to transfer this shape and then cut it out. Now watch out kids, I have the guard taken off this grinder. This will not forgive you even the slightest brush. So if you do this, you do it at your own risk transfer the shape to the piece of metal and then literally I bent this by hand using a block of wood and the edge of the bench and some clamps and this is a more versatile way than even you know putting it in a vise. You know you can get a variety of angles with this and using a hammer to ease it along that can work too. So I'm left with the original or what's left of the original part the cardboard template and then the new panel made in steel. I offered that up and it was good. It seemed really great, but before I could weld it up, I had to do some more prep on the rest of the car. So off came the outer rear arch and then sections of the inner rear arch, just so that I could slide the sills in and start testing them, which is what I did. And then I prepped the outriggers and gave them a lick of paint. This sheet is just to stop the overspray. And then I was able to make a few little last minute adjustments before I welded in the A pillar. These repairs to the side of the footwell and the bulkhead, these are the panels that will kind of meet and hold the A pillar repair. Now you see this tool here, this file, I've heard them called pencil sanders, finger sanders, belt sanders and power files. You need one of these, this is an electric one. You usually see them operated on compressed air, but I can't see how you do a job like this without one of these. So then, with the A-pillar repair welded on, it was time to start refitting the sills. You remember the little blocks of wood that I made on the offside to keep the inner and outer sills square to each other? These are so crucial. You'll probably see them knocking around in these shots here if you keep a close eye. They're so easy to make, you just put the two sills together, make sure they're square and then take measurements and cut them out of wood, cut out the little blocks out of wood and just slip them in when you're doing this welding so that you know nothing's going to move on you, you know, if it gets a knock or while you're working. I'm making little adjustments to everything as I go, just making sure that it all stays true, stays square to itself and that there's no issues with anything basically going wrong. And I suppose that's the way to tackle the whole job. Slowly, slowly wins the race. 
The rear section of the floor here below the rear seat base, it was quite bad, I cut that out. Then there was a small repair to the welder, it was just one of the feet came off, nothing serious. And then some finishing on the A-pillar and the plug welds on the sills. And the A-pillar is great, except this one line here. Look at this. I'm probably gonna obsess about this every time I drive the car. I should have crisped up this line when I was folding the panel. I didn't, and I wish I had now. It's just a stupid little detail. Onto the B-pillar. You're gonna see this jumping round as I work on it. How did I locate it? Well, I scored the floor of the car before I took the tack wells out of this B-pillar and released it off the old sill. And I scored them right deep back into the floor because I knew I'd be taking the sills out. And these are just the way I located the pillar when I was welding it back on. All right, so that's done. And you've just seen about 16 to 18 hours labor represented in this section. So two good whole days. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I need to make an appeal before I go. I'm about to move on to the rear section of this car. It needs a new rear cross member and a new boot floor. And I want to do the floor in aluminium, but the shipping from the UK is nuts. If you have one of these things in Ireland or accessible easily to Ireland and you're willing to sell it, drop me a comment, get my email address from the about section of the channel, do whatever you can, get in touch. And if I could get this sorted, it would be a big weight off my shoulders. That's it for now, back to me. All right, this is what I wanted you to see. This is my Mini. It's a Paul Smith limited edition. They only made, they kept about 300 of these for the UK market and sent the other 1500 to Japan where they love all things British, all things Mini and all things Paul Smith. So it was a very clever marketing exercise. This is the last Mini. This is the one I've kept and I will always keep. I had a few before this. The first one I kind of inherited from a girl who turns out to be a griffin. And her dad was a champion mini racer, I think in the 70s, which really kind of piqued my interest. And I learned from those guys that a mini is a fantastic car to learn how to drive and have fun with. So I've had one, I started out with minis um, when I got serious about cars and that's why I wanted to show it to you and that's why I just wanted to come back and reconnect with it before I reconnect with the Griffins fully. So, the Esprit is next and the Esprit is what I've been doing um, mentally to keep myself in a good place because the web series is in, has been very tough to produce at the moment. It's in a bit of a tough spot despite fantastic support. Thank you so much for the support. We will try our best to keep it going and what I've been daydreaming about is um, the weight loss program that I will put the Esprit on. It has a curb weight of about 1,022 kilos. We've got to get that below a ton. In keeping with the Lotus ethos and um, the Lotus way, I will try and lighten that car as much as I physically can, but keep it aesthetically exactly what it is, which is a Series 2 Esprit. So, we're still in the strip down phase. I'm so excited to get into the rebuild phase because that's when the real fun will start. But in the meantime, here it is. And so we move tentatively into the rear of the Esprit. This is the engine cover. I suppose it's supposed to be acoustic, but thin GRP like this isn't much of a sound insulator, I don't think. As we scan across the engine bay, looking at this, what do you see? Well, what I see now that I'm looking with a very critical eye is a lot of excess baggage. There is weight to come off this whole setup here and I am really looking forward to getting into that, but I'm not gonna to touch that until we get the chassis sorted and the suspension sorted. So, the airbox is in reasonable nick. The trumpets, one of them is definitely not in reasonable nick and looks like it might've even been replaced, I'm not sure. I realized I'd never even checked the oil on this car. What was the point? So I had a look and it's nigh on new, which tallies with what Hadley told me about having looked after the car before he put it away. Never doubted you for a second, pal. Now, look at these lights. There's something going on here, and I swear I have seen this on other Esprits. It's such a bad angle, you're gonna have to take my word for it. The first thing you can see is in the left light, the near side light, the black surround is kind of twisted, it's warped, it has a bump in it. I'm gonna have to try and sort that out or else replace it. The second thing is, this light is not straight on the car. I am sure of it. It's very, very slight, but I have seen this on other Esprits too. I think this was a production line issue. Maybe there was a guy with a touch of gunner eye or maybe it was a bad jig or something, but I, I'm sure I have seen this on other Esprits, even in magazines. But like I say, it's subtle, so you wouldn't necessarily notice it. 
So out the lights came, I took a little measurement of the rivets, do you think I can remember what it was? <laughs> but I took a measurement anyway because I'd like to put them back like for like. So I moved on down to the rear bumper and the rear valance. And what the hell has happened here? This rear valance has been put back on about three quarters of an inch lower than it should be. And <laughs> just why? <laughs> I'd love to know why. Now I thought maybe the exhaust guys, because this has got a bespoke stainless steel back box on it, and I thought maybe those guys put that on and then didn't have the clearance and have to drop it. But if you look, it could do with being back up that extra three quarters of an inch for the exhaust sake anyway. Right, well, let's have a look at this bumper. Okay, so I doubt this hardware is original and looking at what's underneath it, it looks like there was probably captive brackets here that got ripped out. Maybe somebody stood on the bumper or something like that. Maybe we'll find out when we get the history of the car, which is still on the cards, by the way. I'm chasing it still. And look at these plates. Weight. Excess weight. I am going to try and get rid of all of this, not just lighten it. I'm going to try and get rid of it. I have an inkling of a way that I could do this that deletes all this hardware. I'm really, really excited about this weight loss thing. In the meantime, I went to strip the number plate plinth, and what did I find? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, another bodge. <laughs> I'm supposed it's not strange for a car this age. But I want to show you this GT3 RS that came into flawless detailing. And when they went to take off the front number plate on this to do a proper job of giving it a paint correction, they found exactly what I found. Some monkey decided that new screws should be put through this instead of using one short enough not to pierce the bumper. It's such a small thing. But this is a 300 plus thousand euro car. Anyway, it just goes to show that nobody is immune to this kind of bodging. All right, that's the esprit for this time. Weight loss will be in full effect, and I can't wait to get there. Okay, you haven't seen much of the van, and the reason is, is because I've gotten to a point with the work that because I can't afford the panels yet, I can't do any more, or there's very little I can do. So, whereas I don't have a full complement of visuals for the strip down, because I started stripping this thing in 2008 before I had any notion of this web series, I do have some footage, so, here is some of the strip down so far. So you remember the van had been left on common ground and vandalized. Uh, yeah, they shot the hell out of it, broke the windows. I've seen better groupings, lads. And they took out some of the panels too because they were firing at those. So they really did a nice job. And then somebody must have been driving a truck or something like that and hit it. So this damage wasn't there before. So the front panel has to be done too now. Anyway, I didn't dwell on it. I dragged it back down. And by the way, it's panelled inside with this shiplap, which I've kept because I think it's really cool and I've got an idea for. So this is really going to be just a quick video to show you how simple these things are. This engine comes out when you take out, I think it's only six or maybe eight bolts. There's a couple at the aft section on it on this bar and there's four on the back that attach it to the gearbox. And that is it. It's such a quirky little engine. I'm sure if you just fed this some fuel and a 12 volt feed, it would just sit on the deck happily running. I think that if you ever hankered after one of these and you wanted to do a restoration, you, you know, this is a great thing to get. If you can get one, get one. Because unlike, let's say, an old Ford or especially unlike a Mini, because of the size of this thing, everything's kind of spread out and easy to get to. Plus there's some really simple concepts, engineering concepts that are brought to play here that aren't, you know, on your average car. And they're really interesting. So you've been watching the few little bits and pieces you have to tackle to get the steering column and steering box out. There it goes. Oh, and here's one little thing. Here's one little specific thing. This pin that locates the handbrake lever it's known to seize and people have hammered at this until they were blue in the face. The conventional wisdom is go straight in at this with an angle grinder and then replace it once the thing's off the car. All right, so here's some general stripping, a ball joint on the steering arm. You know the trick of hitting this on the side. You hit the side of the joint here rather than hammering on the top to try and drift the ball joint out. The ball joint in this wasn't in good nick so I didn't mind heating it. This is some of the heating vent pipe coming out and the two horns that were on the car and the brake master cylinder. Yeah, look, 
these things are only getting more valuable. If you ever thought you want one, just get it now. And the cool thing about them is they share a lot of the engineering with the older Porsches, you know, the engine and gearbox layout, torsion bar suspension, and there's so many modifications you can do to these things, so many accessories available, and lots and lots of suppliers. So you won't get another chance. You know, they're just, like I say, going up in value. If you want one of these, get one. All right, Valley Pro time. And the care pack this time is going to a guy called Harry Proctor who got in touch to show me his Defender 110 and his 1951 Singer 4AB. What a lovely little thing this is. Belonged to his grandfather and he is gonna start restoring it now, which is what a nice thing to have, Harry. Um, and by the way, hardcore with the chickens, love it. All right, if you would like a chance to have this care kit which has some really lovely stuff in it it's packed full of goodies go to the about section of the channel and you'll find my email address and tell me what you're up to tell me what cars you have and what's going on okay patreon joseph mccafferty catherine mcconnon and colin brennan who upped his existing pledge guys thanks a million colin you must really want to see this road trip with a jag i do too it's still kind of pie in the sky but hopefully we'll get there okay I'm gonna now give you a teaser of what happened when I went back to reconnect with the Griffins. I met my old buddy Gar and his great uncle Stee and we took some of the family photographs to show Stee and see what he came up with. So here's what he had to say. Stee Griffin is a master mechanic, racing driver and engineer and the youngest of the Griffin elders who I went just to do a recce with. So this is just a few little snippets of the things he said that really piqued my interest and an idea of some of the stories that I hope to get from him. Those um, workshops were the stables for, um, for the Belfast Telegraph that because before the war they, um, they delivered all the paper by horse and cart. I was bringing another car down later on. There was a traffic jam when we got near near Dunboyne and uh, when I got to the top of the traffic jam, the AC Bristol was in about three or four foot shorter than the world when he left the garage. He'd run it into a woman head on in another car. That was Dave that jumped in and apparently he put the fur out rather than the, 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 the Aston Martin mechanic. He ended up going over and intervening, like get yeah, out of yeah, the way yeah. kind of thing. The works Ferraris were in Dundrod and the when Desmond Titchington went out in practice, I suppose you'd call it qualifying now, but in, in practice on the Thursday and Friday night, he was quicker than the, um, the Ferrari Wooks guys. The Ferrari Wooks came along and um, they wanted to run the car under their banner and... Um, they wanted to steal the from under <laughs> Yeah, they wanted, yeah, exactly. That's it for episode seven, and it really has been a trip down memory lane. When I arrived here in this industrial estate, it turns out it's being used as the mechanics area for a stage of a rally. So I had to stop and have a look at some of the Mark II Escorts because when I was 15, myself and a buddy had two of these. We used to rally around the fields, and it was the start for me really when they'd break down and we'd coax a mechanic to come out, and I would watch what he did, and I didn't even know I was interested. But anyway, that's for another episode, hopefully. In the meantime, please like, please subscribe, and please share. It's, it's just so important for the welfare of the series. Okay, next time I hope to bring you some of these stories, these racing um, history stories. Until then, good luck. <laughs>